And hello, and welcome to our program this evening, an LGBTQ plus learning workshop, information and resources. My name is Krista Danis, and I'm the events and program coordinator at the Aurora Public Library District. We are super excited to be partnering with the Aurora Human Relations Commission and our speaker this evening to provide you with this important information for our LGBTQ plus community here in Aurora. This session is being recorded and will be posted at the library's YouTube page for, few, for, for future viewing. And we'll be posting links throughout the session. Um, we'll be posting a book list. Uh, we'll be posting links to a survey. If you could please take that and let us know how, what you think of the, of the program and, and some, a, a ton of other really, really informative links. So without further ado, I will hand it over to one of my favorite colleagues, Berta Bailey, to talk about the AHRC and to, do, to introduce our amazing speaker. Well, thank you so much, Krista. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> So um, good evening. On behalf of the Aurora Human Relations Commission, I would like to thank the Aurora Public Library for hosting this very important event. We welcome all of you and thank you for joining tonight's presentation. This is the first presentation of the 2020-2021 Fairness and Equality for a Better Aurora event series presented by the Aurora Human Relations Commission. If you are a member of a local community group working on issues related to our work, we would welcome an opportunity to work with you and to help your members and further our work as well. Please contact us to, decide, to discuss how we can work with you. The HRC is committed to ending discrimination, embracing diversity, and empowering Aurora. If you feel that you have been the victim of discrimination, the Commission is a local resource for you. You can learn more about how we can help and submit a complaint through our website. We will post that on the chat. Through our event series, we hope to provide Aurora, our community with information that will make us a better Aurora. Future events will include discussions about housing and LGBTQ plus friendly business practices. To learn more about the commission and learn more about upcoming events, please follow us on Facebook. And welcome, Erika with a K. We are so happy to have you here tonight. And thanks so much for doing this very important presentation for us. Erika was born in Chicago, lived in Texas, and as an adult in Mexico for 10 years. She now lives in the Chicago land area. Erika is Latin, Latina, queer, a poet, and an artist. She works for a youth violence prevention nonprofit and has traveled around the country educating, empowering, and encouraging youth and adults. Tonight, Erika will share her coming out experience, will talk about issues facing the LGBTQ community, and will share some of the resources for us to use in the future. I know we will all learn a lot from you tonight, Erika. Thank you so much, and it's all yours. Berta, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much to um, everyone that made this possible to the Aurora Public Library and to the Aurora Human Rights Relations Commission. Thank you very much. And I'm thrilled to be here and welcome everyone that is here with us tonight. So let me go ahead and let's see if technology is gonna cooperate with us. I'm gonna share my screen and set us up. And here we go. Berta, can you, you see that okay? I think so. You're on mute, so I can't yes, hear you. I just I want to make sure. Just fine, Erika. You are okay. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you, everyone. Welcome so much um, to this workshop. And if you're watching it live or recorded, either way, I am glad that you're here to share this time in this space together. My name is Erica with a K. My pronouns are she, her, and. Um, goals, objectives today really are just to share a little bit about my story because there's way too many chapters in my novel to share all of them. So I'll be sharing a little bit of my story, talking about LGBTQ plus the basics, just some of the foundational knowledge. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what it takes to build a human being and some Q&A. And as we move forward, I just want to, again, let everyone know that everyone is welcome here. Please participate, listen, be curious. I want you to ask questions and share comments in the chat. Uh, I want this to be more of a conversation. I know we've got technology. I know we can't be in person, but that doesn't mean that we have to feel disconnected from each other. So please ask questions, share things in the comments. I want to help 
be a part of, of your thoughts and your questions that you might have. And very important to know, please know, I am not an expert. I'm not here uh, saying that I've got a PhD or I'm not here to say, well, this is what I know and this is what I think you should know. I'm not here to lecture. I'm simply here as me, Erica with a K, just as one human being to uh, another human being, sharing my experience and a little bit of my story and hoping that somewhere along the way we can help build bridges and tear down some of those walls that too often times seem to be a part of our everyday life. So who am I? Um, it's hard to say. There's so many different facets to me. Uh, and I'd like to think I'm still that, that giggling little baby. There's still that part of me that's still that giggling little baby um, holding on to that little rattle up there in the corner. Um, but I'm also part of a lot of nonprofit organizations. I do a lot of volunteer work. I'm part of the League of Women Voters. I'm a member of, of PFLAG. The DuPage chapter. I do a lot of volunteer work. I used to do a lot more with the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. I go out in March and I, I, I see it as um, my obligation because so often times in my life when I had been silenced or I felt I didn't have a voice, they're always somehow in that darkness, no matter how bad things seem to get, there was always someone that somehow was a voice for me or found a way to lift me up. So now it's me giving back um, and, and doing what I can. But I have found that a great way for me to share a little bit about who I am rather than telling you uh, my name or, or the labels attached to myself is through my poetry. And I get really nervous when I do my poetry. So I recorded this poem that is called Let's Start With Hello and hopefully through it, you can get to know a little bit about me and perhaps we can find some commonalities. Um, so here we go. I am the daughter of immigrants, Latinos proud and strong, born and raised on the south side of Chicago without a lawn. Until I was four, then we got a house of our own. No longer tall stairways narrow to climb or roaches infesting the place we used to dine. No more bullets or gang members whizzing by, and yet it didn't matter because things had already been designed. The moment I was born, I was defined all sorts of labels already assigned, my actions predetermined, my place already set, the boundaries of who I should be needed to be met. I found myself thinking, before you judge me, can we not digress? Let's start with hello. Look at me, do not read the labels. Do not let me be defined by what others think is right in their own mind. You shared in the jokes about me when I was a child. I fell and hit my head and you were all smiles, sinister and sad because you did not realize that what you were doing was all you had, void of reason, worthy of treason. And even though you made me cry, I still wanted to sit with you outside and say, let's start with hello. You mocked me for speaking more languages than you. You laughed at my parents when they wanted to meet you. You put gum in my hair. You pushed me with your stare. You told me I was wrong for daring to dream. That one day we could sit and share an ice cream. The tears welled up and it was a pain beyond numbing, beyond burning and seething and, and sort of bubbling. Stretched as thin as I could be only to be let go, snapped back like a clown colored rubber band. And you hurt me and that made you proud. But still, I heard the sound in me. Let's start with hello. You beat me down, but I rose up. Here I stand today, no longer afraid, not in a place of darkness, not in a place of hate. I see the world as I am, not as you would have me be. I see a rainbow of colors. I see me. Let's start with hello. Standing up when fear would have you sit down, tearing down a wall of discrimination and shame to build a bridge of equity where we are all the same. Being an upstander is embracing your voice and your power. It is knowing now that you are not sorrow. You are the light. You are the hope. You are the song of tomorrow. Let's start with hello. Thank you so much for listening to that poem. And um, I think through it, it, it really shares a little bit about my story and a little bit more about who I am. Um, and I, I, this image is, is kind of uh, an all including image. And that is me, if you see there on the soccer field, uh, that's kind of a symbolically me on the soccer field of life 
wanting to play, wanting to be part of a team, wanting to belong and, and wanting to be able to get in that goal and make that big play to, to win the game. Uh, but I couldn't really ever do that the first 34 years of my life because I was walking around, running around basically in my own closet, if you will. And it was full of all of these things that are surrounding this image here. All of these things are, are um, things that touched me in one way or another in my first 34 years of my life. And, and if you look at all of that, it, it's very heavy. And you can imagine it leads to a lot of trauma, a lot of pain. Um, and what ended up happening is I was definitely not the best version of myself because when one is carrying around that much pain and one has all these walls built around oneself to protect oneself, then it's very easy to become a person who is angry, who is short, who is judgmental, who criticizes other people, um, who is constantly trying to put other people down. Why? Because I was reflecting onto others that which I felt within myself for myself because of all of these things that had been part of my life that I had experienced. And um, what ended up happening is because I was carrying all of this around in me, it led to me becoming chronically ill. And in, by the time 2011 came around, I had been chronically ill at that point for close to 15 years. And a doctor had actually told me that I probably wouldn't live to 30 at the, the rate that I was going. I had countless surgeries, countless states in the hospital. They just couldn't figure out what was wrong with me definitively. Um, and in 2011, I found myself in the hospital on an afternoon. I was going to have surgery. They weren't sure if I was gonna make it out of surgery or if I was even gonna come out whole out of surgery. And I found myself in the pre-op room and it was kind of dark. I remember it being very cold. I had a thin little sheet, you know, those, those hospital gowns that they give you, I mean, it's really just a little little sheet, drafty. And I just remember being so cold. I was just trembling. And I think a lot of it was just the fear. It wasn't just that it was cold, but it was also just the fear as well. And I found myself cold, sick, alone. Not There wasn't one friend there with me, not one family member. I had created this life for myself full of so many walls that I had managed to isolate myself in a way where I was not letting anyone in. And I said to myself, this is not any way to live. I'm full of all of this darkness, all of these lies. I can't live like this anymore. If I manage to walk out of this hospital, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm gonna live my life, my true authentic self moving forward. No more shame, no more blame, no more criticizing other people. I'm just gonna be me. I'm gonna fill myself with love and light. Doctor comes back and he says, Erica, you don't need surgery. We just looked at the, the MRIs, you're good. We don't know what happened. I literally walked out of the hospital without surgery. And that moment I decided I'm coming out. I'm coming out of the closet. So I did, I came out of the closet in 2011, but it wasn't just the queer closet, the gay closet. I didn't just come out and say I'm a lesbian. I came out of all of the closets because we all have closets. We all have skeletons. We all have something to be ashamed that we shouldn't be, but we feel shame about, we're embarrassed about things, mistakes that we've made, people that we've hurt and we have that somewhere hidden. And I said, that's it. I'm, I'm cleaning out the closet. I brought everything out. And I said, I, I'm not carrying the weight of this anymore. I, I want to be a player now. I want to be part of that team. I want to score in the game of life. And that's what ended up happening. And how did I feel after I came out? I just felt liberated. I felt peace. I mean, this, this picture just kind of sums it up. I love this picture because it really is how I felt. I had never felt so light. And I swear, I, I seem to age backwards. I think I got 10 years younger overnight. Um, just the way I walk, the way I talk, the way I held myself, everything changed because all of my walls came down. But what ended up happening is that my walls may have come down, but other people's walls did not come down. I ran head on into other people's walls, primarily in my own family. And I felt the rejection and the hatred in a way that I had never experienced in my life. And it was the most painful because it came from the people that had told me my whole life that they loved me. But that love was not unconditional, it was conditional. It's like, I love you as long as dot, dot, dot. I love you as long as you dot, dot, dot. There was a lot of conditions on that. And it was something that was, uh, I have no words to describe. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to face. But at that point I had made my decision that I was not going back into that closet. And if it meant losing my family, it meant losing my family. What I did is I found a new family 
which is what often happens with people in the queer community when we come out. We lose our biological family, but we find a whole nother family. We, we find friends that become our family and take care of us. So I was very fortunate that I found a phenomenal community of, of people to become my family to support me. I started dating someone at the time who was wonderful in supporting me. And um, I was in therapy twice a week for a whole year, lots of tears, um, but I stayed strong and steadfast because I realized that this rejection and this hatred, it had nothing to do with me, everything to do with them. So where does this hatred come from? Where does this reaction come from? And I think it's important that we understand it because if we can understand it, we can dismantle it, get to the root of it. And if we are the persons that have this type of reaction, then we can understand why and we can change that, we can evolve. And if, if we're on the receiving end of that, then it helps to understand where it's coming from and to understand this is not about me because I've learned in all of the work that I've done and, and, and just having been bullied so much as a kid, but then also becoming a bully, that the way a person treats other people is not a reflection of who that person is, but it's a reflection of who you are as a person. Did I say that right? I'll say it one more time. So the way you treat other people, it's not a reflection of who they are. It's a reflection of who you are. So why was I rejected? There was the fear of the unknown, a lack of knowledge, a lack of what it meant to be lesbian, to be queer. There was this, this fear of the unknown, lack of resources. There wasn't a support network. Where do I go? How do I get information? The only thing I know are the negative stereotypes I've seen my whole life. Growing up in movies, you hear in songs, the jokes people make at family parties. So all you have is this negative image, negative stereotype. You don't want your child, you don't want your loved one to fall in that category. What are people gonna say? Oh, my religion doesn't allow it. So it's not permitted, so you can't be it. And that feeling of shame, having nowhere to go. Who do, where do I go with this? My family is not gonna accept this. So I'd rather reject my child and maintain my standing in the family because my child will eventually have to come back to me. I know they will. Um, so I understood that this is where all of this was coming from. And I could only do what I could do, which was walk my journey. And it was up to them to choose whether they wanted to walk their journey um, and what that evolution was gonna look like for them. When I came out, I had no idea what it meant to be queer. I had no idea what it meant to be lesbian. I didn't know how to be part of the community. I'm like, is there a special pin? Do, do I get like a little card? I'm officially part of the queer community now. Do I get a little checklist? And it just begins by learning because even though I've been out now for nine years, it doesn't mean I know it all. I do not. And the more I learn, the more I realize I have so much more to learn because human beings, we are complex. There's so many facets to us. So I just wanna share with you some of the basics that helped me understand and find my way. This is not the end of a conversation. This is the beginning of a conversation. And I'm hoping that what I share is going to encourage you to kind of pull on that little thread and keep pulling on that thread and keep going with it and seeing where it takes you. Um, so queer, oftentimes you will hear the term LGBTQ. Sometimes you'll hear LGBTQIA plus or LGBTQ plus. So let's just talk about that alphabet a little bit. Um, queer is an, what we call an umbrella term. It, it means that every other identity kind of is included in that umbrella. So when you hear LGBT, that is stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, but there's also asexual, intersexual, pansexual, and so many more. In fact, one can even say that the identities are infinite because every single person in theory can identify in a different way. So we want there to be one way where we can all be a community. And saying that we're queer, it means we're all included versus leaving somebody out. So for example, sometimes people will ask me, they're like, oh, well, what's your ethnic background? And I say, I'm Latina. I don't say I'm Mexican or I'm Ecuadorian or Colombian. I say I'm Latina because Latina, again, is an umbrella term that includes everybody that identifies that way. And I wanna be inclusive. I wanna be part of that community. I don't wanna be part of a, a demographic or a minority that, uh, not a minority, a group that stands out. Um, and I'm not saying that I don't say sometimes that I'm lesbian, I do. But I want to un everyone to understand that being a lesbian is still being part of a bigger community, which is the queer community. And I want everybody to feel that they have uh, space and room under that umbrella. So there's no wrong way to identify. And whichever way someone identifies, we should respect that. If someone says, I identify 
as trans and my pronouns are he and him, great. Then you simply respect that. And um, just like sometimes, and this happens to me all the time, I'll run into people in the elevator and I'll say, oh, look at your cute little puppy. She's so adorable. And they'll say, oh, it's a he. Oh, okay. Oh, he's so adorable. It's not a big deal, right? The conversation continues. The same thing if you meet someone and they tell you that their pronouns are she and hers. And in conversation, you, you say he, him, you just, oh, she, and you just correct yourself and you keep going. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. When we know better, we do better. So that is just kind of the basics when it comes to the LGBTQIA+, when we talk about queer, it's an umbrella term. And you don't have to know every single term under the umbrella. All we have to do is have that awareness of however someone identifies is valid and should be respected. And that really is the basic, most important part of it. And here's something I wanna share with you. It's called the gender unicorn. And I know it's a lot of information on, on one image and I don't expect you to memorize it or understand all of it. I still don't even understand all of it. And that's why I said, I'm not an expert, but this is something that has actually really helped me understand over the years, how complex we are as human beings, how complex our, our not just our sexuality is, but our identity and the way we express ourselves is. And here's the other thing, no matter how you identify, you're part of this gender unicorn. Everybody is part of the gender unicorn, no matter how you identify. So again, there's that commonality that we all are assigned a sex at birth. It could be female, it could be male, and it could be intersex. And if someone is born intersex, it means that they have some male parts and some female parts. Does that mean they need surgery? No. Does it mean they need to get fixed? Absolutely not. Does it mean there's something wrong with them and they can't lead a regular long life? Absolutely not. They are perfect just the way they are. There's nothing that needs to be fixed. But that is just the sex that's assigned at birth. There's also the gender identity. I might have male parts, but I might identify as female. And the way I express myself might be a combination of traditional male, female clothes. Maybe I combine them. Maybe you know I'm gender non-conforming, meaning I don't identify as male or female. I'm non-binary. That's just as valid. And then it's about who you're physically attracted to, who are you emotionally attracted to. So I was assigned female at birth. My gender identity is female. My gender expression tends to be pretty feminine and I'm physically attracted to women. Although actually, let me correct myself. I'm physically attracted to one woman, my wife. So, um, and I'm also emotionally attracted to my wife. Uh, so I will clarify that. But um, so, I just want you to know that this information is available for you online. I encourage you to go to the link. It's available in lots of languages. And there's actually modules and exercises that you can do um, that are provided on the website. It's really a wonderful tool. And how young is too young to talk to kids about sexuality, to talk to kids about being gay or, or LGBT or what it all means? There is no age that's too young. And some people are like, well, it's kind of touchy stuff. Well, it's interesting because how often do I, does it happen where you'll see a four-year-old and you know, they get home from their first day of kindergarten or their first couple of weeks and someone will say to them, hey, Erica, so any cute boys, do you have a little boyfriend yet at school? And they're in kindergarten. We're already objectifying our children without realizing it. We're already introducing those ideas into their head. So all I'm saying is it's okay to talk about these things at any age. Um, there is no age that's appropriate to talk about this any ages, because at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is acceptance, love, and appreciating the differences in our humanity and celebrating them. That's really what we're talking here at the root of it all. And that's what we should focus on. And that rejection, that hatred that I felt and that I still feel from people sometimes um, is because a lot of these are the ideas that are going through people's minds and I don't blame them because we grow up with such negative images, such negative stereotypes, the jokes, the comments that are made. And to be queer, to be LGBT, so oftentimes is, is like, does it mean that they're promiscuous? This person must have HIV or they have AIDS. Oh, they're gross, they're a pervert. It's someone that has no religion, no morals. Absolutely not. Does it mean that they have a mental illness? Is that why they're queer like this? Is that why they're so flamboyant? Why do they gotta be so gay? It's not because they have a mental illness. That has nothing to do with it. Does it mean that people that are queer generally have a higher rate of mental illness? Yes, but that is due to the trauma 
the oppression and the marginalization that we experience, especially black trans women of color. They are the most um, targeted demographic um, and children as well are the most targeted demographic. So when they say be a threat to children, um, we are not a threat to children, people in the queer community. 98% of um, sexual crimes against children and sex trafficking is perpetrated by people that identify as heterosexual. And of that majority, the majority are heterosexual, heterosexual men. And I don't remember the exact um, statistic, it's somewhere I think in the 80s, um, but when it comes to children being uh, abused in, in the home, it's usually men and it's almost always somebody that they know in the family whether it be a family friend um, or somebody that somebody knows. So we are not a threat to children, absolutely not. Um, unable to have children, absolutely we can have children. There's many ways to have children um, and we do not live a life of sin and darkness, but just depends. What do you define as sin and darkness? You know, for someone that might be drinking a glass of wine once a month, I mean, everyone has a different definition. And that's what I mean. It's, it's about just acceptance. It's about understanding, um, not garbage. Being queer does not mean someone is a waste or garbage, and it isn't something that you can cure. There's absolutely nothing wrong with someone who is queer, just like there's absolutely nothing wrong with someone who wants to be a lawyer or a doctor or a baker or a painter. It's no different. You know, there's nothing wrong with me. It, this is not a choice. Whereas wanting to be a lawyer, wanting, those are choices that one makes. Wanting to be gay or queer, it's not something you want. It's just something you are. Um, just, you know, so oftentimes people will ask me, they're like, Erica, when did you know that you were, when did you decide? That's the question. When did you decide to be a lesbian? And I'll say, hmm, that's a good question. When did you decide to be heterosexual? And they'll just look at me and pause. Well, I, I, I didn't decide. I just, just knew. And I said, there you go. There's your answer. I just knew. That's it. Um, so, that's the root of where that rejection, that anger comes from, that because people feel threatened, because they're insecure and they lash out. So it's important to understand where things are, are coming from because if we can understand, then we can change, we can evolve, we can do better. And I know I did. It made me go from being someone who was miserable and not a very nice person, quite frankly, um, to becoming a person that's just full of joy. And that is my joy was to just finally learn to accept myself and not worry about the world's judgment on me. Um, and I had been looking outside of myself to find that which was inside of me the whole time. And that was unconditional love because up until then, the only thing I knew in my life was conditional love. People that were willing to love me, but there was a bunch of buts and things that were expected in order for that love. And when I realized that unconditional love is actually possible, then my life was no longer full of that darkness. All those walls came down, all those toxic relationships, people in my life seemed to just melt away. And all of a sudden, without even asking for it, but just kind of standing still, it all just started to come together and love started coming into my life. Light started coming into my life, but that's because it was actually inside of me and I was reflecting it out. Um, so it's kind of like, like a moth, you know, they're, they're attracted to the light. And that's what happens when one finds that light within oneself, we start, um, attracting the light to ourselves. And I want to just say this, which is really important. Having a gay child, a queer child, a trans child, it doesn't mean that you failed as a parent or as a caregiver. Disowning your child means you failed as a parent. Disowning your child for being who they are, that's, that's failing as a parent. It's not a punishment to have a queer child. Just like it's not a punishment to, to have a child that maybe is born deaf or blind, you know, we're all born different and that's okay. It is our differences that make us so beautiful and powerful and wonderful. It's what adds texture and complexity to our lives and beauty to our lives. So I just wanna challenge you all to have that thought. And if you ever see someone or hear someone that is upset about having a gay child, a queer child, or they're struggling with how to deal with it, just say, you know, you didn't fail as a parent, but if you disown your child, and you push them away, then you're failing as a parent. Um, I unfortunately have, have uh, heard stories firsthand. Um, I was lucky that I came out when I was in my 30s and I wasn't kicked out of my house. I, I had a place to live. I was able to take care of myself. But too often I hear stories firsthand of children 
um, that are very young that are kicked out of their house because they, they are queer, they are found out and they are kicked out into the street. And that's one of the reasons why I do what I do because I do not want to see that continue to happen. I want us to get to the root of that fear and that rejection, what causes us to react that way, to understand it because if we can understand it, then we can stop it, we can change it, we can prevent it and we can fill ourselves with love and pull down those walls and start building those bridges. So I wanna share a video with you that I really, really love. It's really powerful. And it's a partnership that PFLAG did with Oreo. And um, PFLAG is one of the nonprofit organizations. They're national. And um, I'll talk a little bit about them as one of the resources, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I was unable to embed the video and I'm going to reshare my screen so I can then share the video with you all. Give me one moment. Let me make sure I can bring that up. Hopefully technology. Oh, wait, I have to stop sharing because I realized what I forgot to do. I need to check a little box to make sure that the sound comes through for you all. Let me maximize it. And I'm going to go ahead and play. Hey. Hey. You okay? I'm good. I'm stopping the video for a moment. I'm being told that the reading list is on the screen, not the video. Can you hear um, me, Betha? I, I'm seeing the video. You are seeing the video? I am seeing the video, yes. Krista, are you seeing the video? I, I am seeing the video. Okay, um, just wanted to make sure. And on Zoom, maybe somebody clicked the link and just needs to close it out. Got it, okay. Yeah. That's a good tip suggestion then. I'll go ahead and continue. Thank you so much. Here we go. Look at you. Hi, Mom. Hi, baby. Mom, this is Amy. Oh, hi. It's so hi, nice. Hi, Amy. Hey, Dad. Hey, I'm Amy. Hi. Nice to meet you. Are you hungry? Yes. Oh, uh, yes, please. Homemade jam. It's really challenging to be Oh, my God. That is such a powerful video. Um, I always tear up every time I see it. And Berta, you had shared with me that someone has a question. 
I do. And yes, the same thing happens to me every time I watch that video, Erika. So this is a question and it reads, Erika, if you could give just one piece of advice to queer youth, what would it be? One, only one piece of advice. It's to believe that there's nothing wrong with you. The world is going to do everything it can to tell you that you're wrong, that you're broken, that you're messed up, that you are less than. And just believe that there is nothing wrong with you and that it's the world that is wrong. And that's okay, because sometimes it takes, it takes the world because it's bigger than we are and it's slower to catch up to us. Um, but just believe that you are perfect. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you, no matter what the world would have you believe. And I believed that for 34 years, um, that there was something wrong with me. And I finally realized there's absolutely nothing wrong with me. It's just that I was too bright for the world and they didn't know what to do with my light. And that's the only reason they kept trying to put me out. So um, that's what I'm saying to you. You are a shining star and the world just is not ready for your light, but don't let them dim your light. You keep shining and believe in your light and you let it shine bright because the world needs you and needs your light and your beauty and your strength. Um, so just one step at a time, one breath at a time uh, and know that I think you are amazing and beautiful and wonderful and you're not alone in this world. Thank you. Great question, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and back to sharing my screen and thank you for the question. Um, if there's more questions, please let me know. I, I do not mind. Uh, I, I want this to feel again, like a conversation and I really appreciate that people are hanging out with us. I know for some people it's late and um, I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, I love this video and I love what it says at the end that a loving world begins with a loving home. It's really where it begins. And it's about the way I see it is children are seeds and we have these wonderful seeds as adults and our, and our jobs as adults is to nurture them. It's not to step on them, but it is to create that space to nurture them and, and to let them grow and to blossom. And maybe you were expecting a red rose to grow from that seed, but you get a blue rose instead. Don't squash it because what you may not realize is that you needed that blue rose in your life way more than you needed that red rose. And that's why you got it. So it's, it's not a mistake. It's, it's exactly what you needed. And it came your way because you are the right person to protect that flower and to nurture that seed. Um, and, and I will say that for me, one of the things that was the hardest when I faced that rejection, um, and that's why uh, suicide and attempted suicide is so high in queer youth and in especially in teenagers is because of that rejection. And for me, I was so terrified of that rejection that I didn't come out when I was 16. I waited till I was 34 and there was a reason I was terrified and rightfully so. Um, but what I didn't know then is that there's definitely supports. You don't have to wait. You don't have to torture yourself. But one of the things that was hardest for me that was said to me by a family member when I came out, um, you know, as I shared in my poem or as I've shared is that my dad died by suicide when I was 16. And someone in my family said to me, they're like, that's why your dad shot himself because he preferred to do that than have to live in this life with a daughter like you. And if I had a gun right now, I would shoot myself because that's a better alternative than having to live in this life with someone like you. That's heavy and that's hard. That's a lot of hatred to absorb. I can't even imagine being a six-year-old, a 10-year-old hearing something like that come out of an adult's mouth. And I was fortunate that I didn't live at home anymore. I had my own home. I had a support network. I have insurance and I could afford going to therapy, but so many people do not. Um, but I want you to know there are resources and if you are a person who is struggling with someone coming out to you, there's help, there's resources, there's supports, you're not alone. And that's what I want everybody to know, regardless of where you are on your journey, you are not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, and we all make mistakes, but we can learn from them. And I am very proud and happy to share with you all now that I am very out and proud and par proud to be the rainbow sheep in my family. And I can guarantee you, I'm not the only one, but I'm definitely um, the one that is out and proud. There might be more in my family, but I just, I just don't know about it. Um, but these are my parents. Um, that's, that's my mother and that's Angel. Um, my biological dad, as you know, passed away. And so Angel is just, I just call him my dad now. He's been a part of my life for so long. 
and my parents are older, my mom is older, and she is a living testament to the fact that it's never too late to learn, to grow, and to change. Because after almost four years of being separated, um, we reconciled, and we have the most amazing relationship now, a relationship I never, ever had with her before, and I never, ever thought I would have. And it's not just because she changed, it's because I changed. I was no longer in the closet. I no, no longer had all these walls up. I was no longer judging, criticizing, gossiping. I was no longer blaming and being angry at her because of everything that had happened in my life, like it's your fault. No, I let go of all of that. I was living in love. And when you can live in love, you make it easier for others to live in love and find love in themselves. And then together we can find each other and create that bridge and tear down those walls. And um, and that um, next to, me, to the picture, that's my me and my wife, um, that's Kelly. And we've been together now for nine years. And um, she is the best thing that's ever happened to me in my life because she's the person that actually taught me that unconditional love is possible because I'd never known anything but conditional love until I met her. This woman is fearless. She never flinched once when I threw everything at her that had happened to me that I'd experienced. And she just held my hand through all of it. And she just always believed in me. She taught me to believe in myself. She taught me that to be queer, to be different is something to celebrate. Uh, it's not something to be ashamed of. So I, I love her for, for that in so many reasons. And I cherish uh, my parents and I cherish my mother. And not once have I ever judged her or blamed her um, or been angry at her. I understood her pain. And a lot of that pain was as a mother, you don't want your children to suffer. And she didn't want me to be queer because she thought that meant I was going to suffer more. And what she didn't realize is that I was actually suffering more living a lie as a heterosexual woman than living my true self. And now she knows that and she sees me and she's so proud of me and I'm just so proud of her. So I want you to know that there is another side to that pain. If you can work through that pain together and be compassionate with each other, but more importantly, be compassionate with yourself, we can get through to the other side. We can meet each other on that bridge. Uh, it's possible. And um, this is not about shame or blame. It's, it's about growth. It's about learning. And it's about making sure that we protect our seeds, our children, our beautiful little ones that come into this world to grow and to blossom. I mean, look at these faces. Look at these beautiful faces. Each one of them is, is a story, is a dream. And we should not be ones to squash them. Our job is to nurture them and to show them that everything is possible and that we are here to help them make it possible. Um, and, you know, it's one thing to have children. It's another thing to raise children. So whether you are a parent, a caregiver, an educator, whatever role you have and, and whatever role children pay, play in your lives, in a way you are a parent. And what does it take to raise a child? It's an idea, a vision, and it's not your idea or vision. You know, we have our idea and vision, what we want for our lives. We need to let them have their idea and vision. And our only vision for them should be one of growth and one of dreams and light and unconditional love. That's important. Not conditional love. Like, I will love you as long as you grow up to be a doctor, you graduate from college, you buy a house. No, I will love you no matter what you grow up to be, because whatever you grow up to be is going to be who you want to be, who you deserve to be. And I'm here to support that unconditional love, which is hard. It is really hard because I struggle with it every day to unconditionally love myself. I'm very hard on myself. And I think most of us are. But then I pause and I remind myself, if I'm hard on myself, then I'm going to be hard on those around me. And that's not fair to them because they're struggling too. So I got to be kind to myself so that I can be kind to others. Knowledge. And I'm not talking about having to get a PhD or going to college or university and reading books. I'm just talking about learning being okay with going on the internet, being okay with finding an article, going to your library, um, reading, watching a documentary, just trying to fill yourself with a little bit more knowledge, um, creating a foundation. You know, you need to have a strong foundation so that child can grow and to, to, to blossom and thinking about what it means to have that foundation and communication. I was terrified of my parents when I was a kid to talk to them uh, because in my innocence as a child, I would ask questions and sometimes they wouldn't know the answer. So I think the reaction would be one of, anger, just like, why are you asking that? You don't need to be asking that. And I think it's just because they didn't know, they weren't sure how to answer it. Um, you don't want children. You don't want to be afraid of other people, of each other. There should be a mutual respect. 
regardless if someone is four years old or 94 years old, there should be a mutual respect for one another. Patience. And I'm not just talking about patience with children or patience with others. I'm talking about patience with yourself. Be patient with yourself. You don't know what you don't know. And that's okay. But you can learn. You can evolve and invest. And we know children are expensive monetarily. But there's also the investment of time, of effort, and the labor. It's a labor of love, metaphorically and literally, right? Being hands-on and doing the best that you can. And it takes people. It takes a village to raise a child. If you're a single parent working two jobs, just trying to put food on the table, you need help. And that's okay. There's no shame in that. Um, so these are just some of the things. And what else does it take to raise a child? There's so many other things. But I like to think that these are the basics. And a lot of us didn't have these things as children ourselves. And when you don't have something growing up, you don't know how to then pass that on to the next generation because you never experienced it. You never felt empathy. You never felt a kind word. You never had a nurturing home. And I understand that when you have been those wounds, when you've had those experiences, it's not easy. It's not easy to heal. I get it. I was there um, and I still struggle with that every day. But I know that I'm not alone in that struggle. That's why, you know, it's okay to reach out. It's okay to say, I don't know. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do next. It's okay to ask for help. That doesn't make you weak. That makes you strong because it takes a lot more courage to be vulnerable and to be honest than to hide behind our walls. Tear down those walls. Take the first step in building that bridge. And it's okay if that first step is a little wobbly and you're not sure. And it's okay if you stumble and you fall a little bit. You can get back up. And if not, I'll be there to stretch my hand out to you and help you up. And that's what I want to do today um, by sharing some resources and some information with you. And there's so many, there's tons of them out there. So this is not the be all end all. These are just some that I'd like to share with you that are accessible um, online very easily. So there's PFLAG and uh, PFLAG is the first and largest organization um, for, for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, just queer people, their parents and families. So uh, a lot of people that come to PFLAG are adults or parents um, that are struggling with a, a child who is coming out to them. They don't know how to deal with it. And it's a place where there's absolutely no judgment. Um, there's only open arms and information and resources and support. So I really encourage you to check out PFLAG. There's also Outspoken Illinois, they're a local organization and they work a lot with youth. So this is a great organization for youth. I know they do some online programming. They do a virtual kind of group where they get together to talk, to share, and um, to just create a safe space, brave space and have community. There's GLAD. GLAD is, is a national organization and they really tackle helping change the narrative in social media and encouraging and provoking dialogue around queer issues and LGBTQ acceptance and IA. So I like to say queer just because I want everybody to be included. I don't want to leave anybody out of the alphabet. Um, but GLAD does a really great job. They do a lot of really great work. So I encourage you to, to check them out, look them up, and um, they have a lot of great resources online. Of course, there's the Human Rights Commission, the HRC. Um, I mean, they are probably one of the best known organizations nationwide. And then locally in Chicago, we have Brave, Brave Space Alliance, which is a rather new nonprofit organization. And check them out online is all I can say. They are fierce, beautiful and powerful and amazing. And I love what they are doing. Um, uh, they are the first Black-led, trans-led, LGBTQ center located on the south side of Chicago. And it's really about um, creating brave space, safe space for, for the community. Um, and, and just a space that too oftentimes trans people and especially Black trans people do not have. Um, so it's a really phenomenal organization. Then there's GLSEN. Uh, they focus on helping create safe spaces and equity for students in schools across the country, whether it be through legislation, education, different initiatives. And they have a lot of phenomenal resources online. So again, this is a wonderful organization that I urge you, encourage you to check out. Um, there's lots of great information. So again, um, they're sharing the links in the chat and there's gonna be a recording that's gonna be shared to the, to the library's website. And there, this document with all the links will be shared so that you have access to them. Mm -hmm. Um, I encourage you to just, just start, uh, just take that first step 
and just remember that unity is what makes us strong, not being divided. It's We all know that walls are not a good thing. We need to tear down those walls and create those bridges. Um, let's just look at history. History tells us everything we need to know about building walls, about hating each other, about being unkind. And as I've said, when we are unkind to someone else, it's because there's something happening inside of us that needs to be addressed. It's not about the other person. It's about me. So let's start with ourselves. Let's start by loving ourselves, being kind to ourselves and understanding that to be queer, to be gay, to be lesbian um, is, is just as commonplace as being tall, short, dark, light, you know, happy, sad, whatever. It's just, we're, it, we're just another part of the equation. Um, homosexuality is, is common in over 400 species in nature, intersex, animals are all are everywhere in nature uh, like it's just variety look at nature and the variety of nature around us and we are a reflection of that as human beings there's nothing wrong with us so again i just encourage you um to let's unite there's there's enough uh there's way just way too much division way too much hatred so um just unite and if you don't know how to take that first step reach out um, there's plenty of support there's plenty of resources for you and I've been out now for nine years. And like I said, I'm not an expert. I do not know it all by any means. There's so much I still don't know and I still don't understand, um, but I ask. And when I make mistakes, I learn from them and I keep moving forward. So it's okay to not know, um, but it's not okay to live in not knowing. What I'm encouraging you to do is to, to make an effort to connect. Um, and, and here's my Instagram. So please just thank you so much for being here, for spending this time, for, for hanging out with me and the Aurora Public Library and the Aurora Human Rights Relations Commission. Um, there's my Instagram. I am part of the local um, DuPage chapter in, in of PFLAG in DuPage County. That's their website if you wanna check them out. And um, again, just thank you so very much for, for being here. And um, Berta, thank you very much for, for helping drive this and are there any questions we i think we have some time for for questions and comments we do have some questions erica uh so the first, yeah wonderful hi um hello so, <laughs> the first one says what tips would you suggest for a teen who who is wanting to come out that's a wonderful question the important thing especially for teens um is that you make sure that you are you feel safe so sometimes not coming out is the right thing to do maybe in your home uh it's different for everybody you have to take a look at who your support network is do you have a trusted adult someone that you can talk to in your home and your family in school perhaps i always say is start by building allies for yourself start by building a network for yourself someone that you can talk to someone you can support and it can be a local organization it can be an online organization and that to me is, is the most important thing because you it's important to be supported um, because that's what I did even as an adult the first thing I did is I didn't know how to come out so the first thing I did was connect and I found a group a support group so that I knew that I could ask those questions so I knew I could feel supported so for teen I think the most important thing is to make sure that you are going to be safe is it safe for you to come out at home you don't have to start at home you can start out with a friend you can start out with uh, someone in a community organization or somebody at school, and then just do it in a way that feels okay for you. Um, so that's my biggest thing, especially with teens. I just want you to be safe and feel supported. Glisten is a great organization for you to reach out to, absolutely. So wonderful question. Great, thank you, Erica. So here's the next one. How can our community be more supportive of the LGBTQ people? Yeah, that's, that's a phenomenal question. And, and I love that question. Um, and to me, I think that's an easy one. It starts with us as individuals. So the way to be more supportive of the queer community, I think is by just starting with, with ourselves and being aware of the things that we say in our daily lives, uh, the things that we do, the things that we participate in, um, and even just speaking up when you're in a family situation, a social situation, whether it's with family or friends, and someone makes a joke, that is in poor taste, or someone says, hey, look at that gay person over there. Oh my God, you see the way they walk? Hmm, that's an opportunity for you to be an ally where you are speaking up and you are saying something. So it starts by just starting with our everyday lives. 
um, and what we're doing, what we're saying, and how the people around us are, are, are saying and doing things. Uh, but that can also be a little threatening, right? So the other thing I can and say is to join an organization like PFLAG, reach out to them. For example, PFLAG does not require you to be a member to attend their meetings. Uh, find a support group, find some literature, watch a documentary perhaps, and if nothing else, go to your local library. They are always full of resources and a wealth of information and knowledge for you. So the best thing is to just start asking questions, start learning and start growing. And um, don't be afraid of messing up. It's okay, because I still mess up. Um, and uh, no one's an expert. We're all learning. We're somewhere all on that journey. Yes. We're all humans. That's right. Um, Erika, and then lastly, how can the Aurora Public Library better support the LGBTQ community? Wonderful question. Um, and first of all, just a big shout out to the library, because I, I think um, for everyone that's here present, um, recognizing that libraries really are such a, a center point of the, of the community. Um, I love libraries. Uh, I used to spend so much time in the library when I was a kid at my local Chicago Public Library when I was a kid growing up on the South Side. And it was really a, a place that was safe for me. And I would just um, urge and the, the library to continue to have programs like this, just continue to create spaces that are brave, that are safe for people to have these conversations, to be able to talk to be able to learn, to be able to make mistakes and not be judged. Um, and, and also uh, continue to just invite people to be part of the community. But I feel like you all already do so much. So to all of you watching, please take advantage of, of your local library. And, and if nothing, I'll stop by just to say hello to them. And of course, COVID times, can't do it physically, but can still do it online. Maybe send them a shout out. But um, I think y'all are doing a wonderful job and this is a testament to it. So thank you for that. Well, that's the end of our uh, questions, Erika. I just want to thank you on behalf of the Human Rights, Human Relations Commission in Aurora, the Aurora Public Library, and myself uh, for really being so honest, so caring, so giving, and the information that you have given us is just marvelous. So thank you, thank you very much. And I just also want to remind everybody to know that um, the Human Relations, Aurora Human Relations Commission, we put the link up on the chat so that you can access that if you need to. We also have a book list created by the Aurora Public Library that's also on the chat. So please you do use that as a source. And we also have put on the, on the chat a survey. So please fill out that survey. Let us know what your thoughts are, comments, and we will definitely look through every single one of those when we receive them. So anything else? Berta, I just I just want to say thank you, Berta. Thank you, Krista, and thank you to everybody here. Um, I, I couldn't be, I never, as, as a little kid growing up on the south side of Chicago, first generation, would have never thought it possible for me to ever have an opportunity like this um, to, to be able to, to share. And, and so just thank you for making this possible and thank you for um, helping be a light uh, in the darkness for so many. Really appreciate it. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Erica. Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great Hopefully we'll see each other soon. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> All right. have, have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Yeah.